uh, the last piece of tape, the last bit of tape you saw, was a pre-production airplane that was purchased by Wayne Ramsey. This one has all the registration in the surfaces that indicate where the front seat bulkhead goes and where everything. But in this particular case, we didn't show where the main spar cutout it what is on the fuselage. Those are later versions. Um, but he has the, the primed exterior, the foam, for fuselage. And I would like to explain some things about um, the method of jigging that we used on this airframe that was different than the one we did on the setup of Wayne's. Wayne's was bonded, his sawhorses were bonded to the floor, and his fuselage was bonded to the sawhorses. He knew he wasn't really moving the aircraft at all. This one we did a little differently. We drywall screwed these pieces of half-inch plywood at the bottom of these short sawhorses. And then we, we took long drywall screws and screwed them directly into the macadam, right into the, into the tarmac. Surprisingly enough, they went right in without even stopping, and they are extremely solid. And after having done so, we leveled the fuselage, got everything straight, and then put tape around the corners in all four positions, and then um, took pieces of wood and or bondo and shinned between the fuselage and uh, between the tape and the saw horses. When it cured, we drilled holes to an eighth of an inch in diameter and then ran drywall screws to the fuselage into, through, through the bondo and into the wood, tying into the wood. Now when we want to remove these things, we can, we, he ran some paint around the printer so we can unscrew the saw horses from the floor if we wanted to and replace the whole thing, or we can remove the fuselage from here uh, by virtue of the fact that, we're not, that the bondo will not stick to the silver tape. So we can move this thing quite easily. There's a number of different ways that you can do this. Uh, no one particular way is absolutely perfect. It has to suit your purpose, your, your needs. What we're going to do on this fuselage is we're going to do front gear installation. Um, we're also going to do main spar wings canard, as we did on wings, but we'll make sure that there's no duplication of effort here and we'll just videotape the things that we haven't done on Wayne. So we'll be back with you when we start in the first process. In this section, we're going to go on with the, in, the installation of the NG30 uh, bulkheads. We're also going to familiarize you with all of the elements, all the parts that are going to go into the process and everything's necessary to install preparatory uh, to actually put them in the aircraft. First of all, this is an NG30 bulkhead. There are two of them. Um, normally, they would come with the gloss surfaces on the interior. The NG8 low distribution washer, you will sand the back side of, and the bond in place. This comes pre-drilled, the holes in the correct place. There is a quarter inch hole on the back side that you'll back drill later. So you'll sand the phenolic area, you'll sand the back side of the aluminum, and immediately apply straight epoxy Put the appropriate screws in place. They're an AN509, 10R, remember James? 10R12? I don't know. I, I don't think there's any others in the, in the kit. Um, you'll also need this drawing. And the drawing shows that as. Um, Oh, let's see, number 24, which is an AN 509 10R12. That's correct. An 960-316 uh, uh, three inch washer, AN 960. The, the, the scribe lines around the perimeter are very, very accurate. Attempt to cut the scribe line in half leaving one half of the scribe line on the part and the other half cut away by the blade. After you've cut them, place them one over top of the other and check their fit. You can actually do that prior to cutting. But the holes are all match drilled on a quarter inch thick aluminum drill jig with drill bushings in it. Uh, the scribe lines, if cut correctly, will set you up with this portion of the bulkhead against the F10 or the canard bulkhead. This will go against the inside skin of the fuselage you will not sit on top of foam core. If you find there's foam core in that area, you remove the foam core until it's just outboard of, of the NG30 bulkhead. We'll show you that in a little bit. Um, but again, 
Sand the phenolic face on the inboard surface. This is the right side, no cutout here. The left has a cutout to allow for the placement of the hydraulic cylinder in this area. After you've trimmed the NG30 bulkheads and installed the NG8 low distribution washers, we'll familiarize you with other elements. Uh, before I go any further, after you've done all this work, you're going to take a marking pen and you're going to measure an inch, an inch, and an inch on all of the surfaces that interface to other areas that are going to bond. This to the F10 bulkhead, this to the fuselage floor, and this to the NG31. You're going to do that in both of these parts. And you have plates, which is number one, referred to as a pivot plate. There are two of them. There's a right and a left. The, uh, the thickest portion faces up. The retract arm goes between them, with the T portion of the arm up. This is placed directly over the holes that are pre-drilled through the phenolics and through the layups. You have, you're provided with two aluminum bushings that are two and a half inches in length. And the bolts pass through the NG30, through the plate, through the, the compression bushing, through the opposing plate, and then to the other side of the NG30. After you've done all your pre-sanding, you can bond the, you can bolt all this stuff together in preparation for fitting to the fuselage. We sanded the perimeter all the way around, and realizing that we hadn't bonded these, we uh, popped them off sanded the surfaces, sanded the back side of the aluminum, uh, put resin on the surfaces, bolted it back together again, and uh, in the process, sanded both sides all the way around where we're going to do the bonding. Now we're ready. So we're going to take one of the halves here. We'll take the left one. And this is always one of those rather clumsy situations. We'll find out what we need to do as we go. Run the bolt in from left to right. There is real no preferential means of doing so. There is a washer under the head of the bolt. Originally, we had large area washers in this as well, but with a solid phenolic bushing underneath, it is largely and entirely superfluous. That's what it looks like. This is the left side. It corresponds with the, the uh, NG8 position on the left. Uh, we are going to match drill these once we bolt it all together for this hole that's in place. Now there's wet resin in here, so we've, we've really endeavored very carefully to remove all the resin from the inside of that hole so we don't goob up our bolt. Um, wouldn't hurt probably if you're installing this wet and when you run that bolt through there you put some mold release wax on the bolt so you don't lock it in place. Now we take the upper casting and put it in place. Now the, the fat portion is forward. It goes here. And to be consistent with what we've done in the past, we, we're going to run it in from the left side. Large area washer on this one. Largely a superfluous uh, move. Uh, I say hold over from the original long easy. Now, placement. Get that wonderful fit. So these parts. You really don't want to handle the sanded areas if you can help it. We're going to put mock up nuts on all these right now, non locking types and then we'll start fitting them in the aircraft and we'll it back in a moment. Okay, what you're looking at is the bottom of the NG30 bulkheads with everything assembled. 
mock-up nuts here. If you look at this casting, you notice that it's, that it's really not justified about a center line. It's a long, easy casting manufactured by Brock, and unfortunately it's not perfect, but really it doesn't matter much. When you place your strut in here, you're going to leave about oh, 3 sixteenths of an inch of the strut above the wide end of the casting, bring it down and set it on top of the bushing. Now I've been playing with, with this carpenter square, and I set it up so that I push it against the one side, flip it over, push it against the other, and I'm absolutely dead center. It's not necessary to do it at this stage, but you're going to be doing this when you get ready to, to bond this end in place, and then subsequently you're going to drill three holes here with an AN 509 10R 30 machine screw. It's going to go through an eighth inch thick plate that will fit inside the depression on the bottom of your fuselage. All of this will, will be done. We also have, I'm going to pick this up and bring it into my lab. This can be bonded to that upper casting. We have to take one ply of bid on the back side, and you notice the back side is characterized by this hump. One ply of bid running this direction, allowed to cure, trimmed off edge radius, and then one ply of bid going from the front face aft, trimmed off, and then you're going to position this back inside this casting. This casting will have been removed. But we, we have to position it. Actually, we, we position it and bond it in place centered after it cures. Then we remove it. With the casting attached, we will take these brackets from the front. And we will position them from the bolt in the casting to the center of the NG3 and 4 will be 6.71 inches. They'll be bonded in place with flocks and allowed to cure, and then an AN uh, 525 bolt, or AN4, I forget that, that the dash number will go through the center of this as well. Uh, and this will all be reamed out to size to a 5 16 inch bolt. We'll be back to you when we actually get ready to set up to sand and, and do the bonding with glass on this exterior surface. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this a little bit of flashing right off here, so I get a hold of a pretty good rasp. <laughs> I'll do that to the entire edge and then <laughs> about the same diameter radius that you see on this backside. And you notice I'm wearing gloves. This is S glass. Do not uh, encourage getting this stuff on your skin. When we sand the gloss off the exterior, we're going to do that for the entire surface, front to back, and uh, we'll be back to you when we set it up for glassing. Go. There are a number of ways of doing this, but one of the most effective I know of is just to put a few quick drops of super glue down on the table. Stick this in place. Keeper. And it might not bond. But if it doesn't, no matter, we'll just take some drywall screws and run them through these holes. Stick this down. And then we follow this on top, making sure that you have full overlap. You, you look from above and not see any, any of this wood. Then we'll drape the glass, glass over top of it, bonding this side, the back, and this side. This is the back side. And after it cures, we'll trim this off, flip it over. Sand the sides lightly. If we do it when it's green, that of course won't be necessary. And uh, flip it over and repeat the process of laminating from just behind the radius to the opposing side. We're not going to bother to sand this face until we're ready actually to do the bonding. Back with you after just about the point where we're actually going to bond this thing down. We've cut the cloth. It is 27 inches in length, as is the strut. And it's four and a half to five inches wide. It'll drape just a little bit beyond the edge. We're going to mix up a couple of shots of 2183, 84, or 87 resin. And for those of you who are even further downstream than that, you'll be using our new PKM and resin, uh, PKM and W resin, um, 3325, I believe, but uh, I'll reconfirm that one uh, 
little bit further downstream here. Okay, we're going to mix resin we'll back with you in a minute. Well, a little bit of the last bit of mixing. This was super glued in place. It's very solid. We've mixed our resin. You've seen me do this before, so uh, we're not going to force you to watch this whole process. We'll get back to you in a moment and show you what it looks like when it's all wetted out. And we're going to use some heat here to really do some fast wetting. Well, we just finished. This was two shots of resin. Precisely, we have just a little bit left. It took us about six, eight minutes to do maximum. Yeah, nice. the heat gun helped a little bit. Not real high, not real high heat gun. Make sure there's no air in it. We're gonna we're gonna do, we have it step back from the table the edge so that we can put a box here, put a heater in from one end, and and by later tonight we'll be able to flip this thing over and do the other side so that tomorrow we can do the installation. We'll be back with you then. It may not be immediately apparent, but the uh, previously laid up part is inside a box with a layer of plastic over the top, and there's a small, ever so small, heater on the opposite side, blowing air into it from the side. 120 degrees is acceptable, and you can go to dinner when you can come back. It's cured far enough to trim and lay up the opposite side, which we'll show you upon our return. Okay. Opposite side of this cleaned up the, the wood that was stuck on it in the super glue. And then we're, we stick it back into the casting here. And as I draw it up into the casting to the point where I'm, what, the distance I want of this strut beyond the back of the casting. I'll show it to you from this side. You have it stick beyond the casting, about 3 16ths of an inch. Here. But when it's tucked all the way back and in, and in this condition it did not exist before putting glass on it. There was enough flexibility for you to easily center this when this distance was correct. Well now you can see I have very little distance on the right side, tremendous distance on the left. So to, to be able to recenter this, either I grind the strut or I file the casting. Where I would file the casting would be front on this side, which would be right side up and do the right side and rear left. So I'm going to file here and file here and we'll be back with you after I uh, perform those tasks. We took this off, like this. file if it's right side up it would be front the top right and the bottom left. We put it back together again, checked it and made sure that we could recenter the strut at the back. That's, that's absolutely paramount. Very, very important. All right, now then, we're going to recheck this. What am I doing? Okay. Slide it up, make sure it goes all the way on. If you can see the black line marked all the way around, that's where I'm going to sand, and we're going to bond this in place. We're going to take 36 grit sandpaper. If you have a grit blast cabinet, grit blast, grit blast it, put it in position, and, and then clamp it. And once clamped, put it back in the in the NG30s and make sure that it's centered at the back and allow it to harden. Uh, this is this is what is preparatory to actually installing the NG30 in the aircraft. We'll get this done first. Once this hardens, we'll remove it and uh, and then make sure that the NG3 and 4 are mounted in place. Center to center, 6.71 inches, same as the long easy. These are the Mark IV Cozy brackets, uh, giving much combined thicknesses here, a much greater wall bearing on the 5 16 inch bolt that goes through here. And uh, we'll uh, be back to you once we start to bond this in place. We're, uh, we've already sanded the inside of 36, which by the way, give you the real skinny on this. The truth of the matter is, is that the actual bonding to this casting is not nearly so important as an accurate casting. 
And that's what we're doing. We're casting or potting this strut into this part. It, we're not depending on bond here. We're just we're depending on closeness of fit. And while you do this, make sure you don't get resin on that center pin. It would be an ugly affair. Um, we're going to brush resin, of course, on the areas that we've sanded. In the back. We're going to fill this depression here in the middle with blocks. And then put enough blocks in the middle so it will squish out in all quadrants. And as I mentioned before, we're going to leave an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch of the top portion of this strut sticking above the casting. It's important that you don't do more than that. It will get in the way of how your gear pivots and uh, cosmetically closes the top of its travel when your gear is retracted. There will be a cosmetic cover that goes over top of this, a plate on the exterior that will mate to the exterior of your aircraft and it ducks in if your strut is too long, it will strike the NG31 bulkhead, so make sure it's not more than 3 sixteenths of an inch. Okay, we're going to mix up a quick batch of flocks and be back with you then. All right, here we go. we got enough flocks in there to squish out in all directions. It's coming out the side. It's coming out the top. I'm a little below where I want to actually be, so I make sure I have room for everything to squeeze out, which will ensure resin, flocks, and no air between all mating parts. After I've got it pretty much squished in place this way, I do a quick swipe. I want you to go in the flocks. Back. clamp this and then drop it back into the NG30s. We'll be back with you after we've done that and show you how it centers up in the inside of the uh, NG30s. Then we're going to tend it, get it hot, hope that it cures quickly, and then we'll show you the installation of NG3 and 4. Okay, we got the beats going still, so I hope you can hear me. I've um, become more conservative in my old age. We're going to go 16th to an eighth of an inch here instead of 3 16th. I want to be absolutely certain we have no problems as I talked about before. And we go up to the top side. And you can see how we're centered here. We've got this square set up so that I can check this. Bingo. Bingo. We're dead center. Now I'm going to take a couple of C clamps. Or a C clamp if I got a deep enough one. One C clamp is sufficient. Right to the top of the casting here and snug it up. Getting oozement, or in this case, squeezement. There is a difference. Clean it. Looks about centered. No. That's close enough. That's where we're going to let it cure. So we got some more material from the back side. Now we're going to bake it for an hour at 130 degrees or so, and we'll be able to fit the NG three and fours. Well, we're starting on something new. 
what we're going to do here is, is explain to you what it's going to take to mate your wings to the back side of your spar. One of the first things that we are going to, to check is you're going to measure from the outboard end of your main spar. These are the things that you need. You need a scribe, decimal tape, piece of sandpaper with sticky back on it. We're going to take that. It's about a, a one by two piece. We're going to fold it, set it aside. We're going to use this as a non-skid pad for our plastic clamps here. You're going to measure from the outboard end of your main spar and you're going to determine that you are absolutely two inches to the center of your hard point. Once you've determined that, you'll measure laterally over from that point and you, you'll find is 29.85 from the one mark. But it actually works out to the, the actual dimension is 2884 or 2885, which is fine. That's if you built exactly the plan. Um, now we go to the wing and we measure over two inches from the end. Take your pen, two inches, and we do the same thing. Take, take the one, two liner, eight, four, if you bury the one. Exactly the same minor disparity between these two marks. I'm about an eighth of an inch off here as I am on this side. Two nine or eight five, by the way, it's just fine. I'm about a tenth off from the two. You have plates that are that are three inches wide. The exterior plates on James Spar and the exterior plates on his on his wing spar are two inches wide. That will be changed here in the future to a three inch wide plate. There's absolutely no problem with it with the two. Um, the triple zero one, the prototype is flying with two inch plates in all these areas, as, as is the long, long easy, and it's been flown to nine G's in their show performances. Half of his plates are three inches wide on the interior, the other half are two inches wide on the exterior. Um, you've determined this so that if you see something like this, this gap here, he's got about three sixteenths of an inch here at the top side, and the bottom of his rib is directly against the spar. So it's, it's possible that he trimmed this too much. Uh, it can easily be handled when you put the strake in place and you let the flash extend all the way out to the outside so you cut it to match. Uh, we're going to remove all this stuff and show you how he began prior to mating it up to the, to the surfaces. We'll take it off and we're going to transfer these marks down to the appropriate height for the drilling and then we'll show you how we transfer those marks to the forward face of the inboard portion of the spar so you can maintain perpendicularity to the face as you drill through. And we'll show you that process. Drilling this part here is very easy because it's open and accessible right from the end. Uh, it doesn't take any transfer to the forward face whatsoever. Okay, what we're looking at here is the outboard end, left side of the spar. We've measured two inches, two inches inboard to this line. Describe the line. You measure 1.3 inches down from the top, describe a line. 1.2 inches up from the bottom, describe a line. Now I have it written here on the side. Now the reason I've done this is that in case some of you are deaf, you can read it right off the back side of the spar. See the dimensions on the left? And then in the middle here, it says 28.85 inches. That is from that bolt center to that bolt center. The inboard bolt center, as I said before, is 28.85 inches from scribe on describe line, and it is measured at 1.75 inches from the top to the hole position, which is this upper line. I need to transfer that information to the opposing side of this. So I'm going to put a straight edge down here on the bottom surface, underneath the main spar, this way. And then I'm going to take a, a carpenter square and set it up. So it comes right up to the mark. 
going to lock it in place. And I'm going to go to the forward face, transfer that line straight up for the height, and then I'm going to measure down from the end and give myself a cross here. This, this will help me maintain perpendicularity as I go into the wing. Okay, as I mentioned before, he's holding the level on the bottom. He's keeping it level. And then I, I set this up here, and while it's level, I can sight right along the bottom of this straight edge and put the mark here. I measured the forward face to the center of the line. It was 30.95 inches. I go from the other side here and transfer, and you see the line? 30.95. You verify it yourself on your own. I transfer this mark down. I already have the crosshair. I drill a, drill a hole here. Oh, that's, that's good, Tim. Thank you very much. I'm going to drill a hole on the forwards face of, on the aft face of this with a 3 16 inch drill and, and then on the aft, on all three points and keep the drills level. I'll use a long drill, put a level on the top side and uh, drill on through. After I get all three holes drilled and I've transferred the hole to this side, I'll stick the drill through, set a level on it, make sure that it's level and that it's perpendicular to this aft face. I'll endeavor to do the same thing on the opposite side. Once this is done, I bring the wing up and made it to the aft face, get the, the centers of each plate centered over the, the, the plates or averaged. You can be actually real close to the edge of the plate and, and still have plenty of ability to transfer load to the part safely. Uh, we'll drill it and uh, we'll, we'll get back to you as we're drilling the in the next step. Roll. Okay, you notice I'm, I'm absolutely perpendicular. This is level. I'm on the mark. You'll find if you push at the back of the drill and not on the handle, you'll prevent the bending of the drill bit. Still looking good. Well, you don't need to see the whole process. You'll know that we're that all I gotta do is stay perpendicular to this face and perpendicular in the vertical plane, and you'll do just fine. So we'll be back with you after we drill all through. Clear? Okay, for those of you who may have forgotten to put on your bondo board at an appropriate time. You need to level your wing now. Grab the end there. Yeah, I'm on the incidence line of my sand down template. Tim's on the incidence line of his. And we have level bubble. That's in place. We just bonded that down. Go over here. Over here the bondo is. Bingo. Level. Let it cure. We'll put the same reference port on the opposing wing. And do all the transfer marks that you see right here. <coughs> And then we'll put the wings against the backside of the spar, clamp it in place, and drill for all she's worth. I know you think Bondo is pretty versatile stuff, uh, but, and so is Phlox. So what we're going to do is we're going to mix some dry Phlox with Bondo before we add any catalyst uh, to get a, a more structural bond between this surface and this surface. We don't have to do anything to this. Bondo sticks the micro beautifully. Don't tell Bert that you're going to use Bondo later on to fill little teeny things. <laughs> uh, but we're going to sand this upper area, we're going to sand this area, just come around the corner a little bit, we're going to sand the bottom, we're going to sand this one here the same way so that we get good bondo stick. I'm also going to sand right down here below, in this area, to stabilize the wing torsionally at the inboard lower end, makes it a lot easier to drill. Remember the little piece of sandpaper that we had folded over on itself? Now these clamps normally come with these big aggravating yellow rubber pads on each end. We want to make sure this thing doesn't move when we clamp it up. So we're going to pull the clamp up here, put the sandpaper underneath it. Come on, just a touch here. here. And then clamp firmly. That'll hold things here a little bit. We can bump it way or another as we need to 
We're going to average this above and below. And remember, I mentioned that you're going to average these marks depending upon where you find your centers to be. And we're about a tenth of an inch inboard the wing mark to the main spar mark. And we about a tenth of an inch inboard of this one, but it brings the whole wing closer to the inboard and decreases the slot opening on this bottom side of the wing to main spar intersection. Now due to parallax, it'll be difficult for you to tell that the bubble is centered, but it is centered. Now that's the left wing. I come across, past the firewall, wait for refocus the opposing level and again because of parallax it's not showing quite level those are the bond the incidence boards now we're going to pan back and show you your tongue depressors between the spar and the main wing note the, the ratchet strap that we use for holding against the surfaces Inboard end, you can see the clamp. You might even be able to see the marks there showing how they relate to one another. I'm going to step back here. I'm going to shut down for a moment and we'll show you how we shoot with a transit. We do the same thing with water level. Okay, thanks for the transit. This has been level. We've got two marks on the wall behind the photographer. Those marks were placed with a water level, and they were placed arbitrarily, actually, drawn on the wall. And I shoot those marks with a, with a, um, a ruler measuring down from the top of the mark. As you substantiate what the distance is down, swing to the other side and do the same. If they are the same, then, then my transit is set level, but I know the water level. I use that then as a reference. Before I make any critical dimension change, I check to see if my transit is still level by using those what we call witness marks. Uh, thank you, Gary Price, for that little trick. All right, now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm um, over here on this end, hand of him, Jim, please. We've got James Redman, and he, uh, we have one person handling, handling Ruler. So he always makes the measurements the same way each time, with the same reference points. I'm going to look through my, I've got 24 inches from the trailing edge up, so I'm reading. Okay, go to the inboard mark. Now your dimensions are going to be the same, all depending, of course, on how high you have your transit set up. And here I've got, what do you change just a bit? 24 and width of the line. Here. 23 and width of the line below 24. 23, 15, 16, 20. Yeah, it's almost. and 15, 16 again. So we are plus or minus a 30 second of an inch difference from one way to the next. We have checked with the levels. Now the next most important reference is the one that we haven't talked about yet is, is with all these things considered we have one more prime consideration here in this equation. That's the relationship of the spar to the wing itself. There is a variation from, from wing to wing. The spars are all the same. Same width at the tip on both ends, the same thickness, of course, in the center. Get one spar. But what we're going to have different is from wing to wing, they're going to be a little thicker or thinner inboard, a little thicker or thinner at this station. So we have, we have some averaging to do, not only with these three dimensions, or these, these two dimensions at the trailing edge. We have the incidence, we have to have correct. It's 
got to be zero set on that water line when the fuselage is set at level. Now I've got a strake that sits on top of this spar that's supposed to mate to the upper surface of this wing. And I've got a strake that sits on the bottom. The primary difference between the top and bottom is that the top surface of this is pretty much dead level all the way across. So if I have a disparity between the top of this and this surface where this is very high or very low, filling is going to be difficult for me to average in uh, because it's all flat. I'm going to end up with a long curved bow. But the underside of the wing, I've got a spar that has a dramatic change from BL55.5 to BL23 because it gets so much longer, it gets progressively thicker. You can, you can see in this section of the wing, for those of you who have built already, this rib is, is, is um, much thinner at this section than it is here. And it's changing at a much faster rate between BL55.5 and BL23. The taper ratio from here outboard is very slow, it's very rapid. So we have this V on the underside of the wing that gives us a tremendous potential for fill. So if you're going to, if you're going to have to average something, it'll be the bottom side outboard end. The inboard edge, you don't want to try and average anything. You want this pretty much to uh, be flush with the bottom of your straight. On this end, top and bottom, I've got about well, a little less than an eighth of an inch above and below the spar. This, I have about an eighth of an inch above the spar. On the bottom side, for most of the airplanes that I've seen, the bottom of the strake ends up flush with the bottom of the wing. The forward corner of the spar pretty consistently sits below the wing contour. But as I mentioned, because of this kick, it's really easy to average in and fill and not be able to be seen, felt, or, or detected in any way. Top side, you can't do that with. You've got to make sure that this is approximately, and I'm going to show you here. Can you look at that. At the forward edge, it's about 3 sixteenths of an inch. At the back edge, above these laminates, it's approximately an eighth of an inch. Can you see that pretty well, too? Mm -hmm. Now I go to the inboard end, and I curve it, it's about, if I continue the curvature, it's about an eighth of an inch back and forward. You have to also take into consideration how much fill you have here. This is a little high right here, so it, it, it'll be less. The bottom side is the same. If you've got a problem um, on the uh, inboard end, because you have the strake ducking down and touching at this surface and then kicking up quickly to handle your, your cowl, the inboard and the upper surface has a lot of flexibility for fill and you won't get yourself in trouble. This is the least flexible area, outboard top main spar. Um, underside, outboard, no problem. This area, average the upper and lower surfaces above and below the spar. At this stage, we're now going to mix a massive batch of Bondo with Flux um, without hardening it. Get it mixed well to a consistency that will hold its shape. And then we're going to add the catalyst to it and bond it here, here, bottom in the same place. We're going to put a blob between the two spars here at the bottom. Can you hear me okay, Tim? Mm -hmm. All right, we're ready to bond. Okay. You can, you can use pieces of wood across this if you want, but I just use big blobs of Bondo mixed with flocks because of its fiber strength. I'm going to go to the opposing side. I do it in four points. But I'm going to get the, the easiest ones first. I've lightly sanded the areas where I want to make sure I have good attachment. I get a little bit down between the two and handle sheer load when I put the weight on it because I am going to take the supports off of the aircraft that are holding the wings up. I'll leave the straps on here, I'll leave the clamp on, but out at the outboard ends of the wings where I've got foam and such and these tables underneath, they're gone. 
I want to make sure that the airplane has a tendency to sit level of its own accord, not warp into position. Still level, nothing changed. Rub it into the surfaces, make sure you get good contact. The flox does have a tendency to absorb the polyester resin from the bondo, making it a little less viscous and more difficult to get to stick. because they've got the foam in the way. There we go. At this stage, I'm not doing much to maintain level. And uh, the reason for it, the reason I'm doing that, not doing that, is because I've got about three quarters of an inch of material carbon, glass, al aluminum, that it's acting as a drill guide. And I should come out very close to the middle of this block when I come through. The first block I'm going to go through is eighth inch thick, which is on the outside of the ring. In the middle of the block? The center. There it is. That's where your bolt head goes. And I'm going to take all these out to 3 16 And then I'm going to take them all out to quarter inch. And remember when we did this hole here on this side? By going from this surface and riding in this hole on the opposing side, it automatically maintains perpendicularity as I go to the opposing side. I've got a lot of meat to go through on this side because I've got eighth, quarter, eighth. Of course, I would prefer not to, to um, break the glass free around the plate, but really the bond of this one ply glass is doing nothing but holding it in its position. When we bolt this up and clamp it, um, it really doesn't matter one bit if the glass is attached or not. Uh, even the other plies of material, the laminates, if they delaminate, or the fact that the bushing is shorter than uh, all the laminates, including the aluminum, it forces everything to be squeezed together so that a bond failure really is of no consequence whatsoever. I'm going to take this one out to the 5 eighths counter bore, um, uh, to quarter inch first and then the 5 eighths counter bore. And Every one of these is identical, so we're not going to beleaguer the issue and force you to watch all of them. This cut's pretty aggressive. Right? That's the last uh, quarter inch we do. Now we shift to the counter bore that we used when Drilling the canard. It's now 10 minutes of the hour of 1 a.m. in the morning. And uh, the elation that, prev that pervaded this evening's affairs here with the installation of the main wing and the main spar and the canard all in one day overtook us. And here we are all experiencing ex insanity. Decided to <laughs> drill one 5 8 inch hole. see from this side is that my 3 8 drive is now I can hover around the center of that 5 8 inch hole. It's easy for me to see and that's how I maintain perpendicularity. Now, this particular type of tool we have 
these little washers that we make. Each layer of aluminum. Come on. There we go. That's a quarter inch. That means that we have one eighth of an inch of aluminum left to go through on this side. And we have two types of tools that I've shown you. One that called, I believe this is called a brooch. It's razor sharp. Goes through like crazy, and it's self-piloting because of the, the barrel design on the outside of the body. We went in about two layers with the, with the counterbore, and then we tried to use this tool because of how sharp it is, and it is doing a beautiful job. This is not going to take no time at all to go through. happening. Oh. <laughs> Let's show them real quick what a bushing looks like when it's stuck through there. LW9's in here. Not on the table. Just your left. There we go. These are the bushings that you're going to cut to length. And it should slide. Except it doesn't go in from this direction, it goes in from the other direction and gets cut short, just short of this opening. The diameter of the brooch was perfect. Very close tolerance. I can't make it, I can't make it wiggle around inside the hole or anything. It fits very well. I want to show you how everything looks here on the bottom side. So you get some idea of what it this is the relationship of the leading edge of the main spar at altitude. The 
There's the inside of wing to main spar. I know this thing will focus. Now we'll go swing this direction and I'll show you what it looks like here. That's where we drilled through. Look at that clean hole right on through. There's a relationship of the upper wing surface here. As I mentioned, it's about an eighth of an inch above and about an eighth of an inch below right there. Here bring to the wing actually being a just a hair above the, the bottom surface of the main spar. The spar is actually below the skin. But because of this angulation here and here, you can lose that with fill very, very easily. Now we're going to go ahead and, and finish drilling up these two holes out to five eighths. Now we haven't done the other side yet, but we're not going to put you through that. There's, you can see clearly through those pilot holes, right through there. Ignore the portal lines. <laughs> see how that works, that nice pilot on there. So you're, you're just not seeing it go through the glass. And carbon. One more carbon. And glass. We are clean. Okay, that's another another hill uh, drill done. That was done entirely with a counterboard and not the brooch. Went very quickly. Um, almost no heat was generated during the, the drilling. And there is the. If you, if you look at it diagonally, you'll be able to see the the edges of the carbon fiber, the interspersing of aluminum, glass, carbon.